Welcome to the Market Watch podcast by Amplify Live, where you can access the latest market insights with me, Anthony Chung, the head of market analysis, and joined by our head of trading, Piers Curran, getting you up to speed on what mattered in markets this week. Okay, a very good morning to you. It's Friday, 28th of May. And as ever, I'm joined by Head of Trading, Piers Curran, and we're going to talk over a couple of the major themes in markets this week, namely the latest initial jobless claims falling to a new pandemic low. We're going to talk about the White House's new proposal for a $6 trillion budget for the next fiscal year. And then from that, going to talk about some of the geopolitics that have been going on, Belarus, Russia, and then talk about China as well. So that's what's on the agenda. But Piers, how's it going? Good. Good morning. Um, looking forward to the chat. Um, but, but you've just uh, sprung, a, well, a surprise on me because you've just told me that we're not going to be actually uh, videoing this as in the visual side. Obviously, the audio is getting recorded, but we're not <laughs> going to be actually videoing it. I've, I've made a special effort this morning. Yeah, you've got, you've got your baby blue ironed shirt on. Normally, no, these days, you're in your hoodie. Yeah, well... I've got a meeting, posh meeting. <laughs> this is actually it's weird. Actually, um, this is the first time I've worn what you might describe as a work shirt um, since, yeah, it must be February 2020, I guess. Um, yeah. Feels a bit weird. But yeah, I'm going into going to see uh, a guy, a big, big, big cheese at Morgan Stanley, actually. Um, so need to, need to. Need You've to got to tie yourself up then. You're going, it's like date night. Yeah, I got a sharp, you know, got to be sharp. <laughs> well, I actually, I actually ventured into town yesterday. Ah, I had to yeah. deliver at a business school that has a entire floor in the shard. I think they've got two floors, don't they? Got or, two floors. Wow. I believe they didn't. They didn't show me the VIP room. They just showed me the standard lecture theatre. But uh, so, what was um, surprising uh, was these these students that I met. They were MSc students. They'd studied an entire year, just about to do their final exams. And this was the first lecture they had received. What, what face-to-face? Face-to-face. Yeah. Incredible. Um, but I talked to the, you know, I, I, obviously I spoke to the students and also I spoke to the faculty. And the technology now is incredible. They had these, um, so they had cameras. Uh, everyone sat there. It's like the UN conference. And they've all sat there in these glass shields. I've got my glass, my uh, facial visor on and there's a camera above my head as the deliverer at the front and every time everyone's got like a, a like one of those stencil old school kind of um, microphones on their desk right. yeah and when they click the button the light goes off on their desk so i can see the camera automatically facial recognition picks them up and pivots to them to their spot so virtually people around the world can interact both online and in in wow. person did, yeah. so did you have people tuning in online as well as those face-to-face? That's, that's what happens when we go global. Okay, we need to up our game here for these, <laughs> uh, for these podcasts. We need to yeah, get I, won't, I, won't tell you how, I won't tell you how much it costs to get out the one lecture theatre. <laughs> <laughs> you might have second thoughts then. Uh, but yeah, no, it was really great to interact with some of these students. They, you know, and I, I definitely sympathise with students all over the country, all over the world, who've had like a very unique... 12 months for sure. Yeah. Um, but I just wanted to kind of convey to them, look, you know, it never feels like obviously a good time to be coming into the workforce. I remember one of the guys I was talking to, he graduated in 2008. I think when I graduated, that was just when 9-11, the recession happened then as well. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. you've got to think that in a pandemic time, right, that there's new opportunity, new innovation, you know, the greatest thing that humanity has is our ability to adapt right absolutely it's and definitely so, about mindset i mean because the problem is you know students trying to get jobs at top you know global institutions you know you're, you're aiming for the top and you're going to get masses of knockbacks and refusals and hmm. rejections and it's just the it, you know it's having the right mindset to get through that and and just you know pick yourself up onto the next and stay stay positive stay confident it's very difficult and you know, yeah, sure. You you can't you can't control the time that you graduate and hit the workforce. You know, that's that's your parents' fault for giving birth to you 
Yeah, yeah, no, not not adhering to the economic cycle. I'm like, how, right. how could you do that to me? Um, so you can't <laughs> control that. So there's no point worrying about stuff you can't control. I know it's easy to say that, but um, sure. I mean, I graduated into a into a recession as well, the post dot com bubble bursting, mm. um, and I found it tough. I think I probably said in a podcast. I'm not sure. I can't remember now. But I I applied to all the banks and I got rejected from all of them apart from one. And mm. you only need one. You know, you only need you know that that half door open, and you just got to smash it down and uh, take what you can get and go from there. Good. That's it. Who needs Wayne Gretzky when I've got Pierce Curran? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, look, let, let's crack on with things. And kicking things off then, we had filing new claims for unemployment benefits in the US dropped by 38,000 to 406,000 last week. That's the lowest level now since the pandemic first hit the labor market, obviously, since March 2020, below expectations. So combination, I guess, of uh, the vaccination campaign continues, albeit the pace of vaccinations is slowed, but we were kind of anticipating that on the supply of vaccines and that should pick up. But restrictions on businesses are being lifted. The other interesting thing, because this goes back to a previous podcast and you were talking about McDonald's and how McDonald's were literally paying people to come, was it 50 bucks to come and have an interview? Just for an interview, yeah. Just for an interview. And one of the kind of things that wasn't top level apparent, but was interesting, I thought, was that many states recently have decided to withdraw from federal unemployment benefit programs following these reports that it's been more difficult to hire because benefits that have been going out for the government pay more than most minimum wage jobs. Yeah. But this is important, right, for this whole idea about the slack in the economy and transitory, right. all these types of things. So what, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's right. The, the, the stimulus checks plus the unemployment benefit bump up. Yeah, it's just meant people, are, you know, they don't want to do, they don't want to stack shelves for minimum wage. You know, who enjoys that? So if I've got the opportunity to earn more money, well, earn, to, to receive more money and do nothing, well, then, you know, people are naturally taking that, right? And so it co it's caused a massive issue. So companies can't hire. There's, there's not, even though the unemployment rate is higher than it was before the crisis, companies can't find anyone who, who want to come and work for them. And it's, have, it's causing real issues with the recovery. And, you know, that's contributing to the temporary inflation spike. Um, so what some states are doing, and I absolutely, I think it's the perfect policy there, they're now rejecting that federal um, unemployment benefit and saying, right, that's not available to people in our states now to just kick people off the sofa and say, look, come on, there's jobs out there. Get on with it. Get out there. Get get working. Uh, you know, let's get back to normal and, and, and off this kind of, yeah, uh, this temporary life support machine, which is the fiscal sort of paychecks. Yeah, and from a, from a context point of view, what we're still seven and a half million jobs away from returning to pre-pandemic levels. So yeah. there's a huge gap there. And, yeah. and obviously this is something the Fed are looking at because beyond temporary or not inflationary conditions, we're a long way off on that side of yeah. things, which is and obviously the, a key focus. And on the jobless claims front, so that was the figure yesterday. And it was like, wow, that's a really good figure. That's dropped much further than was expected. So obviously here, but the, this is an unusual data set whereby the lower the number, the better it is, of course. So the fewer people claiming jobless benefit, obviously the better. So it dropped to 406,000. I was, I was checking back, so I, I just wanted to remind myself because um, you know pre-pandemic, I was looking back, the last time we were at 406,000, you've actually got to go all the way back to 2011. And, and hang on, let me explain. Between 2011 and 2020, the jobless claims number was below 400,000. So even though this is a really good number, it's actually, if you take out the pandemic, it's still the worst number since 2011. So, and actually we went down to, yeah, we were trading down at 200 on this figure um, through sort of 2019. That was the kind of lowest point. So um, even though these states are, you know, blocking this federal support, um, the jobless claims figure is still high. 
in, in, in kind of post, oh, sorry, pre-pandemic terms. And so there's still this output gap, there's still slack. Um, and yeah, there's still, there's, there's still work to do here. Yeah, and, and Joe's aware of that. So what does he do? He puts his hand deep in his pocket is it and finds pocket. and finds six trillion dollars <laughs> and says, you know what, guys, it's okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna propose six trillion dollar 2022 budget to Congress, which would be the biggest federal spending push since the Second World War. Um obviously we're getting into a period now where midterms start to come to the forefront in terms of political positioning, let's call it. And if you think about actually what is in this domestic agenda for, for Biden, and we'll talk about domestic and then foreign affairs, because these are important things in markets this week, because you've got China, you've got Iran sanctions, you've got Belarus and Russia, there's a lot going on. But with Biden combating climate crisis, investments in social services, reduce poverty, expand housing. This sounds like a, like a kind of a, a ticket for success in order for performing at the midterm. So to give people a bit of context with that, because um, I, was, I was saying to you earlier, um, I don't think people even remember in 2010 when Obama first became president and he had his first midterms. It was the worst Democratic midterm election defeat in 70 years. And Biden's name was on that ticket as part of the team as well. So, and Biden's what, 105 years old. So he, he's lived through a couple of these. He knows the deal. He needs to strike big, hard and fast. And that's, that's only accentuated in my mind by a pandemic because there's a lot of people suffering. You know, just like you said, there's a massive gap here. There's a lot of people still you know, facing incredible difficulties. So now's the time to overpromise, and we know what they promise and what gets fulfilled is completely different. I mean, I can imagine there were Democratic officials yesterday when they heard that figure going, oh, <laughs> what, <laughs> in his own party, never mind opposition. Um, so, you know, I just... I just thought that the market, what surprised me yesterday, I don't know about you, but the market rallied on this news. And I was a yeah. bit taken aback by that. Well, I mean, yeah, it's it, on the one hand, it's the classic game of, oh, yeah, obviously, politically, you know, it's, uh, you know, his motivations are partially selfish. Um, with regards to his, you know, ability to get re-elected, but let's we just put that to one side for a second. You know, you know what it's like with a negotiation. Um, you know, you start, you set out your stall, um, and you set it out miles six trillion, and of course, then, you know, the game is well. Hang on, the opposition are going to shut up six trillion. No thanks. Um, but then, you know, okay, then we kind of march towards some kind of middle ground, and, and a deal can be done. So I, I guess the point, and maybe the market's reaction yesterday was more about just increasing their expectations of how much stimulus there's going to be, by no means pricing in six trillion, but pricing in slightly more than they were perhaps um, thinking beforehand, because Biden has set out his stall, you know, further away than where they were expecting him to start from. I think I think that's probably the market's reaction. I mean, obviously, the Democrats have only got a slender majority. And so um, it's going to be an interesting battle in Congress. Uh, and it's going to take some time. Um, but then I see, I thought I'd step back a little bit and just think about this in a longer term context as well. Um, because the academic world has been quite divided on this. Um, so there's a guy called Paul Krugman, who you'll have heard of, of course, um, economics Nobel laureate, no less. Um, but he's a massive supporter of, of Biden, you know, big Democrat. And he puts forward some interesting arguments. And that is actually that governments have really been failing for decades to actually, you know, stimulate, um, uh, the, well, actually to reduce output gaps entirely and get economies growing at their full potential. 
So what happened in the 1970s is kind of a hangover from there. In the 1970s, we had massive inflation spikes in the early 80s, and inflation was up at 10 plus percent, 15 percent, and it was an absolute killer for the economy. And ever since then, governments have, you know, been very conscious of that period and, and you know, wanting to not see a return to it. Okay, so one big argument about too much stimulus, of course, is that it will generate, in the end, it will generate an inflation spike and we'll be back to the 1970s crisis. So naturally, governments have been fearful of stimulating too much. And I think, so that's partially it, it's the, it's the fear of inflation. But the other thing is um, measuring the output gap is notoriously um, in, incredibly different, difficult. And the output gap is just simply, you know, the, the, the difference between the economy, how, how fast is it growing now compared to how fast is its full potential growth? It's incredibly difficult to calculate. But as time's gone on, it's become increasingly obvious that actually we've been underestimating the output gap for like 20, 30 years. So governments have been, their fiscal stimulus strategy has been dogged by a fear to the return to hyperinflate, or not quite hyper, high inflation, and a, a thought that the output gap's actually not that big anyway. So here comes Biden, and maybe his, 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 you know, this is the moment to kind of pivot and snap out of that sort of 30, 40 year lethargy, misguided conservativeness, and actually now step up and get, you know, can he get this economy growing at its full potential? Uh, this is Krugman's argument and, and you know it's interesting I, this is probably uh, it depends how much he gets through but it will probably be the biggest experiment of maybe the biggest economic experiment of our generation and it's just interesting to see how it'll play out but i i do agree on the inflation front i do think we are over obsessed and over fearful of inflation and i think mm. that has influenced policy in a negative way for actually too long now. It'll be interesting because when I think about it and the nature of Western politics and it being shortism in its focus, yeah. like four or five year um, stints, why not go, why not experiment? I mean, you might say, well, what about the future and, and generations to come? But I think that things like debt and accumulation of debt, you know, I remember when the financial crisis happened and the period thereafter, and everyone was freaking out when the USA lost its AAA rating. And it's like, hang on, things have got <laughs> materially worse if you're looking at it with that angle. And yet no one mentions this stuff anymore because we are desensitized and this is the new norm. And, Balance sheets being what they're at doesn't make people panic anymore. And why can't yeah. why can't that continue to grow and be okay? I mean, yeah, well, an interest rates is zero, right? So if you're going to have a lot of debt, now's the time to have a lot of debt. But yeah, I mean, look, it's the ultimate risk. I mean, I, I, I like I'm a trader, so my job is calculated risk, and this is calculated risk. But you know, on us, I, I you know, it's probably the biggest calculated risk. I mean. For, for Jeff, <laughs> well, I don't know for how long, right? And sure, it could fail. And all right, then we got a problem because there'll be a generation or two after us that are going to have to pick up this tab and, mm. and pay for it. Um, or it, it actually might succeed and we could kind of kick onto a growth trajectory that actually meets um, an economy's potential. So, okay. So, with, with all this, then there's obviously a strong emphasis for the administration to focus on domestic issues for the, the things we've discussed. But this week, there's, there's a lot of other things going on that involve the administration. Um, we'll get on to China and, and we'll, we'll discuss a few things to do with that. But I, I guess, the, in my mind, the one that's uh, lower down is Iran. There's been lots of discussions with Iran about trying to rekindle that relationship that they had with an agreement back in 2015, which basically Trump just kind of tore up at the time in regard to their nuclear development of enrichment of uranium and so on. Um, surprisingly, I found myself, oil was selling off last week. I mean, that's completely been taken aback. And in fact, oil's trading right back up there again. 
um, towards $67 a barrel. But um, the idea that successfully establishing a, a new relationship with Iran was going to be easy was a little bit wishful thinking, I think. And I was surprised to see oil come down last week. And I think it's back in its right, right place, to be quite honest. The combination of that not materializing quickly, but also with the whole reopening uh, demand side of the equation, uh, I, th I think oil is well supported at these levels. Um, so that was the Iran thing. Um, but then Russia was obviously a big one because yeah. of the incident that happened with the Ryanair flight and the, a lot of geopolitical tension that's been between the EU, Russia, Biden's been involved. And so just wanted to, to briefly talk about that, because I guess from a trading perspective, you see all these headlines, and that's very mainstream media because it's like, what, there's Russian secret agents on a plane, and they grab this guy, and they down a plane, the Ryanair guy starts coming out saying all sorts. Um, you know, it's tantamount to like terrorist activity and all these sorts of things. Um, but is it important for markets? I mean, but, that's, that's, I guess, the question. In terms of yeah. trade, I guess there's a difference between trading or geopolitically important that could have repercussion more long term. Right, exactly. It's short term or long term. Well, you know, what, I think that on the one hand, you know, those that are coming to markets now for the sort of first time, um, this isn't this isn't unusual where we've got a a Russian um, sort of slash Western uh, political incident here, uh, but in fact. In fact, rather than it being abnormal, it's very normal. And I was just looking at back at some of the incidents. Like, don't forget, in 2014, Russia invaded the Ukraine. <laughs> you know, they yeah. also shot down a Malaysian airline passenger plane, and 200 odd people died. Um, there's airstrikes in Syria. There's poisoning of, you know, former spies here on UK soil. Uh, they've they've been poisoning the opposition leader last year, um, Alexei. Navalin, you know, th this is my point is that this is just another episode. Um, so it's not a brand new thing. That's that's one point to say. The other point though, from a trade like from a trader's point of view, I mean, I, I can't help it. When something happens, I'm like, all right, is there an angle here? You know, is there an edge? Is there something, is, is there a trade here? And what I've so my thought process, I thought it might be interesting to share. I'm like, okay, Belarus, okay, so there's potential, there's potential sanctions going to happen here, right, between Europe and Belarus, and we'll talk about the pipeline, the oil pipeline, in a minute. But just to talk about Belarus specifically. So what what people may not know is Belarus is a massive um, producer of something called potash, which is a, a key component of um, fertilizers. Um, which is used by the farming industry globally. Um, <clears throat> and so they're actually the second biggest producer behind Canada, um, believe it or not. Um, and so if there's sanctions against Belarus, well, then obviously the potash industry would probably be the, the most effective target for the West. That's because the Belarusian government is incredibly rely, re, um, reliant on revenues coming from their state-owned um, potash producer, um, and it's a huge industry there. So, so hitting their potash industry would be quite an effective tool. So if that were to happen and they restrict the supply of Be um, Belarusian potash, well, then you got a potash supply drop, which therefore perhaps the prices of potash goes up, right? So how can you trade that? Well, who else produces potash? Well, actually, Canada's the number one. So I'm straight away, right, who are the Canadian publicly listed potash miners. That, that's my thought process. And, and the biggest of all of them, actually, the biggest in the world is a company called Nutrien. So I'm like, right, okay, there's your, that's interesting. You know, do you buy Nutrien shares off the basis that sanctions against Belarus will restrict supply, sending potash prices higher? So that's a great thesis. There's only one problem. Nutrien, the share price, is already trading right at its all-time high. It's testing a monster technical resistance level. The, the 2018 high, $74.50. It's right there. So actually, it could be an interesting breakout trade. So how long has it been going bid, though? Is it it's a been recent? Going, so it, like, like a lot of 
commodity producers mm. collapse in price when COVID hit. Mm-hmm. And then it kind of bottomed out summer of last year down just, just south of $45, you know, all-time low. Uh, well, since they publicly listed, by the way, which was only back in 2018. So low. And then they've rallied all the way back from $45 up to $75 to test right now the 2018 high. Um, sorry for the noise. Um, so my trade is, right, monitoring that. Are there going to be sanctions against Belarus? Is it going to evolve potash? How's that potash price going to react? Is this a time to buy nutrient shares on a breakout trade as it kind of breaks that 2018 high? Okay, well, the, the, the one thing I would say on that thesis is Russia is the largest supplier of crude oil to Europe. Okay. Indeed. So, in fact, the largest shipments go through a, a pipeline called the Drasba pipeline, which crosses Belarus. So, if you sanction Belarus on potash, if I was, if I was Mr. Belarus, I'd say, excuse me? <laughs> you do realize that I can just push this big red button here and all crude oil stops going through that pipeline that serves Europe from Russia that you are the, that you are dependent on. So don't do yeah. that. <laughs> don't make me do that. They, they've got the <laughs> ultimate kind of retaliatory weapon. Right. Which is yeah. why I'm not buying nutrient shares yet. Yeah. But I, I, I'm certainly on my radar, but yeah. Well, look, on, on this discussion point, um, yeah, one of the main things we wanted to emphasize here, we're going to get to China, was that you know, these things have dominated a lot of the news sphere this week. But when you think about then the involvement of the US, it's kind of, well, where is their energy being deployed? And that's what we're kind of insinuating is that this Iran or relationships with Russia, because Biden is going to meet Putin in the coming weeks and with China, as we'll discuss, is... These things are going to kind of simmer, I would think, in the coming year or so, while these other geopolitical risks get managed and the domestic focus is taken care of, in my mind. But an interesting report out of BlackRock that came out this week, and they have a proprietary geopolitical risk indicator. And it's, it's one of these models that they run, and it's you know, far too long of variables for me to comment on what makes the model. But the point being it fell to a four-year low as of the latest reading they put out this week. And what they were saying was is that look, investors are not attributing a great deal of attention to geopolitical risks because everyone is so focused on inflation and this economic recovery narrative. And they said that actually, their analysts noted, geopolitical shocks is the ma- one major thing that could catch investors more off guard than usual because of the market kind of positioning, if you like, at the minute. The three top three risks that they looked at were separation of US and Chinese technology industries. So that's pretty core cool to the whole entire trade um, battle that's been going yeah. on in recent years. A major cyber attack, which we've seen, we yeah. discussed in a previous podcast, the Colonial Pipeline. And then a political crisis in emerging markets as a result of countries' inability to control the pandemic, the coronavirus, which you could quite easily see happening when you look at countries, I mean, even like India, and thankfully the situation in India is improving from the worst it was at just a few weeks ago. But you can see that, you know, these lesser affluent countries, it's incredibly difficult to control, particularly mass populations like that. So yeah, just quite an interesting thing there, an observation I saw, but that does lead us on to China. And this is the final kind of thing to talk about because um, they had a phone call. It was the first kind of top level official phone call that they've had under the new administration to try and resolve these differences on trade. And they were kind of referring to it as being candid conversations, which I guess is the PR polish to say that they kind of had a discussion. Nothing really happened. Uh, They're not particularly happy with one another. And that was it. But um, I guess China... At this point, their position in this new dialogue is, look, you've got to roll back these tariffs if you want to have a relationship. And obviously, Biden's now, um, I don't know if any, was anyone thinking Biden was going to be softer on China than Trump? I don't think that they were, were they? 
No. I mean, I think, well, firstly, can I just comment on Black Rock's black box? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because um, a four year low for global geopolitical risk. Um, I don't know what they've got in their black box, but I could have told you that. Do you want to know why? What happened four years ago? Trump got elected. Then you had four years of Donald Trump, and now Trump's gone away. <laughs> Full stop. Um, there you go. So, why, 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 do, why do they hire all these, like, uh, <laughs> pay all these analysts so much money? <laughs> anyway, I think Biden, in, in some ways, Biden has got, he needs to thank Trump for one thing. Trump certainly reset in quite an aggressive way. He reset the trajectory of the relationship between the US and China, entirely repivoted it. And now that Trump has reset it, Biden can come in and maintain that much more sort of, um, well, let's just call it anti-China sort of approach and that or, or, you know, fear of China and, and how large they're becoming and how influential they're becoming and taking them much more seriously as a threat rather than, you know, Obama that was much more about being pals and matey. Um, so I think Obama, uh, sorry, Trump obviously reset that and Obama has him to thank for that. Uh, sorry, Biden <laughs> has to thank you for that. Now, Biden's going to maintain this harder approach, okay? Mm. Um, so I think these talks... Fine, you know, they're, they're, they're underway. Candid talks, what does that mean? It means absolutely nothing. It mm. means what? It just means what? They didn't lie to each other? I don't know. But look, they're talking fine, um, but nothing's going to happen with regards to tariffs. And not this year, I wouldn't say. Um, and so right now, you know, from a trading point of view, whilst yes, it's a risk still. You know, these tariffs, remember, the whole world was freaking out about these tariffs um, a few years ago. These tariffs are still there. It's just everyone's forgotten about them. And they've forgotten about them because there's way more powerful things on world economies now than mm. those tariffs. And so it's mm. not the biggest thing to worry about. And so it's kind of all gone under the carpet. But it's still there. And yeah. obviously, China want them rolled back, but it's not going to happen. Yeah, but sh shaping that Biden agenda heading into the midterms, what was quite interesting is when you actually looked at that $6 trillion he proposed or is going to propose today, interestingly, $715 billion Department of Defense budget is going to be shifted in order to take old systems to modernize the nuclear arsenal that the US has specifically to deter China and also develop, they said, their future warfare capability. Hang yeah. about, are we talking Biden or Trump at the moment? Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, well, and that's... Then, yeah, throw in as well earlier this week, the other headline in the news, of course, was um, the administration requesting the origin of COVID report. Yeah. I mean, come on, <laughs> just call it what it is. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, this is the let's out China report. Yeah, yeah and, it's, and it's all domestic politics you know in a way as you're saying with the midterms yeah. coming yeah that that harsh hard hard line against china is a great domestic um political line to take for a u.s president yeah and look let's let's look at at china because this week has been quite meaningful because the chinese yuan extended its gains against the dollar it's going to head for its best weekly performance since november at the moment but when the Chinese currency starts to strengthen, as it has done, and starts hitting multi-year highs, traders get very um, aware of commentary coming out of the state of China and the PBOC about what are they going to do about this. So why is the strength of the currency such a thing for the, for the Chinese government? Yeah, well, that's, that's just all about the fact that China's economy is geared up for um, manufacturing and exporting. Yeah, you know, it's like a classic. Well, it's not an emerging economy anymore, but it's a, it's a developing economy. But of course, it's all about exporting to the 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 developed economies of the world. Okay, now if you're selling goods, if you're an exporter, then the 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 cheaper your currency is compared to the countries where you're sending these goods, the cheaper your currency is, the better, because the price of goods 
for those customers in other markets are, are cheaper. Okay, if your currency appreciates and it appreciates and it appreciates, then the goods become more expensive for your international customers. Um, also, for companies, let's say global companies that use China as their manufacturing base, you know the cost of manufacturing for that global enterprise increases if the yuan appreciates in value. So again, that means these big companies perhaps might start looking elsewhere other than China um, to kind of you know, have their manufacturing base. So a, a, an expensive currency for China is bad, a cheap currency for China is good. But then you flip the argument entirely on the other side. You know, Trump was calling China a currency manipulator for the entire time he was in office. And that was all about, you're, if you're on the opposite side of that equation, you know, China, China manipulating their currency and making it cheaper gives China an economic advantage. And, and there's an economic disadvantage on the opposite side of that equation, which is the US. So the classic story of US jobs being lost to China. Go to Detroit. It's, in a, it's been in a depression for like 30 years. Okay, And it's China's fault because all the manufacturing jobs have gone over there. Okay, so it's all, it's all part of this bigger argument. So, um, so that's the history behind it. So yeah, the yuan has been strengthening um, you know, for the last, well, 12 months actually, but it's accelerated a little bit this week. And there's a big um, sort of, uh, I'd say level, which is around about 6.27, which was the, um, the low in, in, at the start of March, 2018, that people are eyeing up. Um, but I, what I would say is, this, this yuan strength, it's not yuan strength. It's dollar weakness. The dollar has been weakening against all currencies. And so actually, you know, in my mind, it's actually more a dollar story, this move in the dollar yuan, than it is a yuan story. But it might become a, a thing if the Chinese government starts stepping up and going, oi, this currency is getting too expensive here. And, if, and if, the Chinese, if the Chinese authorities can just hold firm and there isn't a breakout of further acceleration in the yuan, surely this is just a timing disconnect of the reopening process because China are ahead of that. I mean, they were kind of the first to get back up. We don't know exactly yeah. to what detail. But the point being is that the Fed are going to have to start talking tapering. They are going to have to taper yeah. and they are going to have to lift rates at some point. It's yeah. just the fact that we're not quite there at that point as of yet. And yeah. so right now, I don't know if, if China can just maintain it. And as they do, I guess they inter it's not like they intervene and bang, it moves strongly. It's just about management, isn't it, more yeah. of the currency than... Yeah, the last thing you want is violent moves in your currency's right. value. That's the last thing anyone wants. That's the last thing China wants. So stable currencies. This is why Bitcoin's not a currency, by the way. But anyway, that's for a different. <laughs> okay, <laughs> on that on that point, then let's talk. Let's talk the yuan. Ah, yes. The, the um, yeah, in my best Jamaican accent there. So um, <laughs> the electronic yuan, uh, a digital currency powered by blockchain technology. Feels like I'm doing an advert for it, <laughs> but. Um, a bit of background then. The EUN is, is, works through a two-tier system. And through that system, the People's Bank of China will, take, uh, will be in charge of distributing it to authorized commercial banks. And from there, banks will be tasked with spreading the currency to their own customers. The overall execution of the release of EUN is to set closely or resemble the existing digital payment methods that are actually already in use. And I think that's where China is quite different from here in the UK for sure and in the US, where we kind of are we're almost victim to legacy systems. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very Absolutely. hard to steer the Titanic yeah. away from an iceberg when you've just gone through this very established banking system of hundreds of years, whereas China don't have that. And China have really embraced financial services in new technology. And that's predominantly been things like WeChat, and WeChat Pay, Alipay. And what I found fascinating reading about this week and just doing some research for this podcast was about, I was kind of thinking, what, what's happened to Jack Ma and Ant Financial yeah. and all these things? Jack like, who? Jack who? It's like he's disappeared. And certainly he was on like a meteoric rise, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, up until probably the last 12 months. Um, and it just seems to me, reading between the lines, that 
the Chinese government are very aware about individuals like him. Um, and in actuality, if you can understand and track people's payments via a digital mechanism, or that that's that's a lot of power in that that information. And I don't think the Chinese government want it in the hands of a third party entity like Jack Ma. Yeah, um, hence he's a, the EUN. Is <laughs> is a victim of his own success, Jack right. Ma. His own unbelievable success, which has put him in a position of power. And it's all about power. And the Chinese government want to be all powerful. And hang on, here you've got this, this guy who's threatening that. Uh, in, a, in a non-political way, mm. or at least initially in a non-political way. So it's, it's an interesting threat for them. And yeah, they've slapped him down. No question. Um, what do you think about these central bank digital currencies, right. though, compared so actually, to, say, Bitcoin? Yeah. Okay. Now, well, first thing to say is that China aren't the first um, government to issue a digital version of their own currency. Do you know who, who, the, who was the first? Bahamas. Yes. That's the first time you've got one of my questions right, I think, in, in 18 <laughs> podcasts. <laughs> no, I did know that your man crush was Paul Gascoigne as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, yeah, the Bahamas, right? But Look, this is the first big economy, okay, to kind of go down this path. And so on the one hand, you're thinking, well, hang on, most of China pay for stuff electronically anyway. So kind of what's the difference here? And okay, this is a digital currency, but it's the, re the reason why it's not like a, a crypto is because, of course, it, it's the whole point of cryptocurrencies is that they're not controlled by a, a central government. Right. It's Hang about, they are. They're controlled by Elon Musk. <laughs> so this is a, uh, yeah, a central government controlled digital currency. So it's like, uh, okay, what's what's the difference then? And I don't, I don't think there is much. I, I, so I, I, here's the thing. I think actually the government. Uh, I think this is, this is a currency that's going to have a place in their system but it's not going to have a big place in their day-to-day -day economic system anytime soon. Um, I think it's a play that just further kind of gives Jack Ma a slap on the wrist. But the problem they have with digital, the problem governments will have with digital currencies is what the last thing they want is savers to switch out of bank deposits en masse, switch out of my bank deposits into this digital new digital currency. The problem with that is your banking system would collapse. The banks need these bank deposits to be able to operate. And without a banking system operate, you know, an operational banking system, go and have a look at what happened in 2008 when the banking system stopped working. We had a global crisis. So the, and it goes back, it's all about legacy. So at the moment, the banking system requires deposits, bank deposits to operate. These digital currencies would replace those bank deposits, which is why they can't be replaced in any big way. I mean, some of the predictions are saying that it might, it might go up maybe 5% of the monetary, uh, of the money in the system might end up being this new electronic yuan. Um, no more than that. And anyway, mm -hmm. they've done some studies, right? And they've been giving people, some experiments, I should say, and they've been giving people free uh, e yuans to see what they do with them, and great, they're going okay. This is all novel. All right, I'll I'll buy something with this. Great, and then the feedback afterwards was okay. Well, yeah, that was interesting, but pff, I'll just go back to Alipay, please, because it's just way more convenient for me, and and you know it's tied into commercial and social messaging networks, and it's just way more convenient for people to mm. operate. Um, their day-to-day -day consumption via an Alipay than it is to have to go via this. Hang on, what is this government digital thing? Nah, not sure. So, so, so you're, you're not a buyer of Alibaba and Tencent shares anytime soon then? Uh, no, I think they've become, that, that story's played out. Hmm. And I think the, the government now it firmly, firmly, it's not only on their radar, they're now acting to curb their influence. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, they've been handing out some sizable fines for anti-competitive practices for, for sure. But look, let's wrap it up there. Um, wish you luck on your um, your date in the city. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> and uh, if you've made it to the end of the podcast, thank you very much as ever for listening. Um, would hugely appreciate it if you're listening on a platform like Apple Podcasts, if you could rate and review, leave a comment. Uh, get in touch with us if you want us to cover yeah. something specifically. Just email info at amplifytrading.com and we'd be yeah. happy to uh, take on board your feedback. But enjoy the long weekend. Yes, absolutely. And you. All right, Cheers, take care. Man. See you.